Okay. Okay. I think it's live again. I I I think. Okay. Good evening. I think this time, I did it right. Praise God. Um. Uh. Let's see. Yep. There we go. Oh man, I had the same challenge that I had last week. I came on right on time and for some reason I don't think it was going live. So I had to I had to log off and try to come back on again for some reason um Facebook changed something so that when you go live, it's in a private mode unless you open it up where it used to be, it went public and you'd have to make it private. So I don't know what they did, but they, they're causing me some problems. So we're here. So, hey, uh, Canadian family, my family over in the Flatlands, Amy, good evening. Um, hey, Catherine, Adrian, good evening to you. Um, hello, Gladys, um, Shakaya. Shakaya knows she heard me calling her. I was calling her just a few minutes ago. She was ignoring me. Good evening, Donna. Good evening, Gwendolyn and Kathy. Praise God. All right, guys, listen, I'm sorry about the mix up. I don't know what happened. I was trying to um, go live and it was doing something weird like it did last week. All right. So um, I posted some notes on your page, on my page for you to access. Um, praise God. They are there for your perusal. And um, so we're going to pray and we're going to uh, jump into um, the work. Hey, listen, my Aunt Mary is here tonight, so we really can get started. My cousin Mary and my Aunt Mary, and you guys all say happy birthday to my Aunt Mary. Um, today is her and her twin sister, my Aunt Martha. Today is their birthday. Praise God. And so... Happy birthday, Aunt Mary. Um, all right, who else just came in? Renee, my friend Brenda, good evening. And um, and you know what, Brenda? I turned on something that said captioning. I didn't know you could do that on Facebook Live, but if it's working, let me... Okay, there we go. She says caption. I didn't know that it would do that, but I was fooling around with it and saw this button and I flipped it. So praise the Lord. It's captioned. Amen. So my friend Brenda can follow along. Um, hey to all y'all. Oh, happy birthday. Oh, everybody's telling my Aunt Mary happy birthday. Praise the Lord. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to my Aunt Mary and my Aunt Martha. Praise God. My grandmother, their mother, had five sets of twins, and they are one of those five sets. We got a big family. It's a whole bunch of us. <laughs> I got a whole bunch of cousins. That's all I'm saying about that. All right. So listen, guys, let's pray. And then I just got lots of stuff I want to share with you and show you on tonight that hopefully um, you will get yourself maybe for Christmas that will help you to, you know, go through the upcoming uh, new year in, in a way that will draw you closer um, to, um, uh, to the Lord. Praise God. All right. Um, Father, thank you for 
this time and this place for these people, for your word, for your spirit. Lord, where would we be without you? Holy Spirit, we are so grateful for you. We are so grateful for your presence, that there's no distance in God, that we can, in our respective homes, come together as one body um, and break open the bread of life. I pray that you will speak to our hearts. I pray that you will challenge us to go a little deeper in the days to come, to know you more intimately, to, to um, open our eyes with thoughts of you, close our eyes at night with thoughts of you. Let your name be constantly on our lips. Lord, we glorify you. We give you all the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. So listen, there is a lot going on in the earth today, okay? Particularly in um, this in this nation. Um, we still have a lot of political unrest, that type of thing going on. One of the things that I find very interesting is um, just the division, you know, you expect in the world. But in the body of Christ, so we, we have to do better. Um, so I, I personally think that we need to learn how to read and study and interpret and apply the word of God. That's my passion. That is my heart for everybody, that you would know him and the power of his resurrection that you would know how to appropriate the voice of the Lord for yourself. Amen. So I want to talk about how to study God's word. I do this occasionally, but I think it's necessary. I believe I put this in your notes. It's probably in the back in the addendum. It's called Three Takeaways from the State of the Bible 2020. It's in the back of your notes if, if you download the notes, that kind of thing. If not, just, just listen. Um, of course, you know, the American Bible Society and Barna Group every year um, or uh, definitely every, no, yeah, every year. They do it every year. They release a report called The State of the Bible. Like, how is the Bible doing in contemporary culture? Okay, so I want to share some of these things with you. And then I want to take a few minutes to actually help you to know how to read and study the Bible for your own self, how to hear God speak to you through the pages of the book for your own self. Okay, because look at this, look at, look at these statistics. Okay, they, they do this report, <clears throat> and based on the, the Barna, and, which is a, a, a very um, uh, well-known research uh, group, and the American Bible Society, according to them, um, 2020 has not been a good year for the Bible. That doesn't surprise me at all. All you have to do is turn on the TV and look. You don't even have to turn on the TV. You can just talk to the people around you and you'll see that that's the case. He says uh, in, the, in his report, um, this is not exactly breaking news, but it's worth saying. 35% of Americans, that's three, almost four out of every American in the country, three to four of them would say they have never, ever, ever opened and read a Bible. Three out of four people, three out of four out of every 10, okay, um, have never opened the Bible. Uh, this is up from 25% at the report's inception in 2011. In other words, as society progresses on, less and less people are opening and reading the Bible. Okay, look at this. 10%, uh, it's changed 10% in nine years. 
60% of Americans read the Bible less than five times a year. So that's six out of every 10 Americans. So that means that if you're sitting in a church on Sunday morning, and let's say you have a hundred people in there, then 60 of those people have not opened their Bible more than five times the whole year. Did you hear what I just said? Did, <laughs> knock, knock, knock on the glass. Did you hear what I just said? If you're in a room of a hundred people, and let's say that that room is a church, 60 out of that hundred have opened their Bible less than five times the whole year. Um, pay attention, like when you go to scripture. In a lot of places, people come to church on Sunday morning, you don't see people carrying a Bible. People don't even carry a Bible anymore. Well, they want you to think that, well, I have it in my phone or I have it in my tablet. Come on. I want to see some real Bibles. I mean, a real, a real that you can touch and open and smell the leather, you know, a real Bible, you know, when you, when you, when you come in the house. That's assuming you're in a place where you're getting some real Bible preaching and teaching. Okay, let's keep going because I want to get to the notes. Look at this. Despite nearly every individual in the U.S. having access to the Bible because of technology, okay, because of technology, nearly every individual in this country has access to the Bible. Despite that, engagement has decreased. So in other words, regardless of how many people have a Bible in their home or how many people have a Bible in their phone, them actually opening the Bible and engaging the text has decreased, okay? Has decreased. That's been a consistent trend over the past few years. And the trend has accelerated since January 2020, so since the beginning of this year, you have, it says throughout the pan pandemic, instead of more people opening and reading and engaging the spirit of the Lord through the word of God, you have less people. Can you believe that? Can you believe that in this pandemic, you got, you know what, you know what people are doing watching CNN? and MSNBC and all that crap, instead of them opening the Bible to see what God is saying about um, certain things. Okay, that that that's frightening, but it makes sense. If you listen to people talk, even people who confess Christ are not opening the book, with the exception of you people who meet me here every week. I know you open in the book because we open it every week. Okay. You guys are the exception, but y'all cousins, all the rest of them folk around y'all, they they not doing too good. Okay. All right. So look at look at this. The data makes it clear the magical thinking that Bible access equals Bible engagement is misguided. So, in other words, just because people have access to the word does not mean that they are engaging the text. Reading, understanding, and immersion in the text doesn't happen automatically. Isn't that interesting? So Barna's research has shown that the majority of the of Americans wish they read more. They wish they read more. Come on, what somebody you know, is somebody holding your Bible hostage or you wish you wish you read more, but you're not actually reading more? Come on. And so here's what they say. Here are the top two reasons why people claim they, they're not reading their Bible. I don't prioritize it. Well, they're being honest like that. It has to be a priority. And I don't have time. You only been shut in the house all year, but you ain't had nothing but time. You haven't had anything but 
extra time this year. Look at this. Maybe the dire situation of the pandemic and the limited activities during stay at home orders could lead people to open up the word. You can only watch so much Netflix. You know? In the early days of COVID-19, it looked like that would actually happen. Like people would actually, you know, come back to the word. As, a cert as uncertainty swirled and people adjusted to the difficult realities of isolation, a lot of people turned to the Bible as a source of hope, but it didn't last very long, okay? In spite of the extra Bible sales, people were buying Bibles. And despite people having more free time on their hand because of quarantine and unemployment and, and, or, or, and or working from home, Bible engagement declined January through June. Somebody need to tell me what people were doing. What were people doing <laughs> when they was locked in the house? And could they order in Bibles that they never read? What happened in the days and weeks after the shiny new Bibles arrived in the mail? What kind of practices and habits did people try? Did they feel equipped with a good understanding of how to study the word? That's what we're going to talk about. Did they feel overwhelmed or maybe they didn't feel confident? And so anyway, I, I, put, this, um, I put this article in your notes from Barna. Um, yeah, Todd, the Lord told me earlier this year that the great apostasy has begun. Well, that's absolutely true. You know, there is a departing from the faith. We studied um, that a little bit in the last a few weeks when we, when we looked at um, perilous times, we examined that text. Look at this. It's time to settle in for the long haul. Merely streaming services won't cut it, okay? For those of us who are streaming our services online, which at Shekinah, we're gonna be doing for the next couple of weeks because we have um, some people that have contracted COVID and we need to quarantine everything for a couple of weeks. So we'll be streaming. But look at this, it says, um, in spite of many churches streaming, most a lot of this year, one in three practicing Christians has stopped attending church during COVID. One in three, one in three believers just stopped going to church and, and they're not streaming either. They have just quit. And look at this, 50% of millennials, 50%, that's people um, right around, oh, age 36, maybe age 36 uh, to about 20. Those are the millennials. Half of all of them just stopped church, everything, not even online. That is a scary thought when they are the future, okay? Um, so look at that article when you get a chance. Look at some of those numbers. It's very interesting. I put it in your notes. So I want to talk to you about, you know, come on, engaging the word of God because. It's our lifeline. This, this is our lifeline. So I want to give you some basic suggestions on how to, when you do open the word, how to handle the word. Because, and I brought some resources to show you as well. I brought some things to show you that you should get or that you should have in your library. And I have even a resource to show you that you shouldn't even take a copy of if somebody wanted to give it to you for free. <laughs> okay, So let's look at it. Seven basic guidelines to following, to follow concerning the Bible. Seven basic guidelines. So when we, when we get the word of God and we get ready to open it, we get ready to open it. What do, what do we do? Let me tell you this, the, the Lord, Spirit of the Lord said this to me years ago. This was back in, because um, I was going through the ordination process in the United Methodist Church. So I'm going to say, 
Uh, this was around 1995, 1995, 96, maybe 94, somewhere around there. And the Spirit of the Lord said this to me. He said, when you go to my word, you let my word inform your theology. You, you don't come to the word with um, pre-information searching for confirmation. In other words, he said, you approach the text as someone who is uninformed, who is searching for answers and for truth. He said, you do not come to the word as one who is pre-informed, searching for confirmation for the thing you're trying to prove. That's not good exegesis. So that's why I want us to look at, you know, some basic guidelines as to how we handle this precious text that we refer to as the word of God. You first want to begin with prayer. You want to begin with prayer, um, uh, a, a sincere prayer, um, similar to that of the psalmist. In Psalm 1, 119, verse 18, the psalmist said, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Let's look at it. This Bible that I have today is the New American Standard Bible. I brought this one today because it is a wide margin. Um, my lights might be, let's see. Can you see? Yeah. See how much space I have on the sides, like particularly over on the far side over here. Yeah. This is a wide margin. I like a wide margin so that I can add my own study notes as and things that the Lord says to me as I'm going through the text. Um, that's just my personal preference. But look at Psalm 119 and verse 18. In whatever translation you have in front of you, um, 119 and verse 18, the NASB says, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. That's an excellent prayer to pray whenever you open the word of God. Lord, open my eyes. You know, sometimes I'll pray, you know, Lord, open my eyes that I might see. Open my ears that I might hear. Lord, I open my heart to you that I might know your truth. You know, um, Lord, break the seals off of the word and um, pour in fresh revelation and insight. I, I, I begin with prayer, okay? So that's one basic guideline. Approach the text and, and entreat the Holy Spirit and ask him to open your eyes so that you can see. Okay, I was just looking at some of your comments. Okay, point number two. So you, you begin with prayer, then just begin to read. Don't allow the cares of this world to distract you from reading the Bible. Come on, we, you know, I have a um, guitar class that I was doing. Um, uh, oh man, I can't think of the, the title of the class, but the teacher, um, one of the things that he um, uh, suggested was that you 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 take ten minutes just. 10 focused minutes every day. And if you just do that, you, you say, oh, I don't have time. Everybody can find 10 minutes, 10 focused minutes. Um, maybe for 10 minutes, I'm going to work on chord changes or on for 10 minutes, I'm just going to work on um, doing some scales or for 10 minutes, I'm going to work on uh, strengthening my bar chords or whatever it is. If I do that every day for um, 10 minutes, you'll be amazed at how you have improved like over the course of a month, over 30 days. So when it comes to the word of God, the same thing. Don't let the cares of this world distract you from reading the Bible. And when you do read it, don't just read a few of your favorite verses, you know, actually read the whole thing. You know, um, we're coming up on the end of this year. We, it'll be January before you know it. 
January is a great time to begin a through the Bible reading program, starting with day one. You can, you can find um, downloads online that will give you a guide to reading through the Bible in a year. We used to, at my um, church that I served years ago, we used to do the um, reading through the Bible in 90 days. And yes, you can read the Bible from cover to cover in 88 days with two grace days to catch up on places where maybe if you've fallen behind. We did it again and again and again and again. Just about everywhere I've served, we did that at Exousia. We did it in Oak Park Faith. We did that when I was up in the thumb, reading through the Bible in 90 days. We used a Bible that was designed by a businessman who was one of these people who um, um, was very careful and intentional about his time, you know, using a planner kind of person. And um, he had designed this Bible that was a large print thin line Bible with none of the study helps is just for reading. And he had um, learned that if you read 12 pages a day, you could read through the Bible in 88 days with two days to catch up. And I know that it works because I've done it several times. Okay. So I exhort you if you are a believer and yeah, you got some favorite passages. Oh, I love Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, you know, I mean, that's, that's excellent, but there's a whole lot more in the book. Okay. Start in Genesis and work your way through, press through um, the middle part of Exodus, Ex Leviticus, you kind of hit a wall, press through Leviticus. Numbers, you hit another wall in Deuteronomy, but press through. It's all the word of God. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, things start to pick up again. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, you might hit a wall again. Ezra, Nehemiah, you know, work your way through. Um, you can find all kinds of different um, things to help you. You can find one that'll have you maybe read in the Old Testament and read a passage in the New Testament at the same time. But you want to, at some point in your Christian walk, you want, man, I felt the anointing on that. You want to read the Bible from cover to cover. Okay. Begin with prayer, open the book and just start reading, just start reading. Okay. And then you want to study. You 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 want to study. You, you we you and I we have to devote um, time um, to to studying the Word of God. Um, if you want your effort to be fruitful, you know our Savior said in John chapter five and verse thirty nine, <clears throat> search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are that this is that which testifies of me. So if you say, Lord, I want to know you. Okay, well, get in the book. This, study the book. This book testifies of him. It testifies of him. <clears throat> so searching the scriptures and studying the word does involve um, uh, more time and effort but it is well worth it. It is well worth it. When you get, you know, either with a friend or in a group like we're doing right now, or you get alone with the Lord and you break open the word, you start with prayer, you begin to read, something jumps out at you that you want to study a little deeper and you begin to dig into the word. I have a Bible. Oh, it's not in here. It's in my bedroom. It is a Cambridge large print leather just the New Testament. I don't think they make them like this anymore. So it's a, it has the, like those onion skin pages. It's a, it's a really exquisite Bible and just the New Testament, large print. And I remember um, at one point I had determined I was going to read through and really break down some of those more archaic words that you find in um, the King James. So I started in like, say, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, 
uh, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, all that kind of stuff. And I just started reading. And every time I, I came a, a, across a key word in the verse, um, I would get my um, concordance and my the Greek and I would translate it and I would write the definition in the margin. And I had been doing that through like, you know, maybe half of the New Testament I've been working through. And one day in prayer, I heard the Holy Spirit say, out of all your Bibles, this one is my favorite. The Holy Spirit said, this one is my favorite because you have set your heart to understand my word. So listen, I exhort you, you, be, you, op, you get a Bible, you begin with prayer, you read the word and you study the word, search the scriptures. Search the script. When you see stuff that's happening in the news and and or just in your life, search the scriptures. See what God has to say about a thing. Okay. And then number four, and then meditate, meditate on it, chew on it, mull over it. Let's look this up. And I'm gonna look this up in the Hebrew. Um, this is Psalm 1. Let's go to Psalm 1. And I'm using a resource that I've showed you before. See the app, see the little green one? The green one is called Bible Study, okay? That green app is the olive tree, it's the olive tree app. And um, so I can uh, open it to that text because I have purchased within the app, I have purchased the um, ESV with Strong's concordance in the Greek and Hebrew. So I can go to Psalm, open Psalm one, and then open it up to um, the first couple of verses. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. So let's then we click on that word meditate and it opens up the word in the Hebrew for me and it gives me a definition. Okay, so the word in the Hebrew is the word haga and it means to murmur, to murmur, to ponder, um, to meditate, to mutter, to speak, to study. So in other words, what the psalmist is saying is that when you, after you pray and you begin to read, and as you're studying the word of God, you begin to say it to yourself. You say it to yourself. You, you talk the word to yourself. And that's important because, um, this isn't in your notes, this is just in my head. I want to say it's Psalm 45, but let me flip there real fast. Yeah, Psalm 45 and verse one says, my heart overflows with a good theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. And so in other words, um, as we're studying the word, when we move into meditating on the word, you begin to think about the word. You talk the word to yourself. You say it out loud to yourself. Don't let people tell you that's crazy. You know, it, it works scientifically and spiritually. This Psalm says that as I say the word, as I'm, as I'm talking the word back to the Lord and to myself, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So my tongue writes the word that I'm meditating on into my heart, it writes it on my heart, okay? And so it's important um, to, to read the word to yourself. Matter of fact, um, you know, if you're parents and you have, you know, kids that live in your home and they're at school or right now, I think everybody might be home, but when you get the chance, you can walk, walk through your house and read the word out loud, wallpaper the walls of your home with the spoken word of God so that it sets the atmosphere in that place. And you know, that reminds me of um, a vision that I had one day um, in prayer. All of a sudden the Lord showed me a picture of my heart, of my heart like shaped like a cube. 
like this box, okay, like a cube. My heart was shaped like a perfect cube. And um, um, I could see the ceiling and the walls and the floor. And the Lord said, take my word and I want you to wallpaper the walls and the ceiling and carpet the floor of your heart with my word wallpaper your heart with my word. He said, so that if anything tries to enter the chambers of your heart, that is not my word, you will immediately know that it's not my voice because you have hidden my word in your heart. That's also in Psalm 119. I want to say it's, it's verse 11. Psalm 119 and verse 11, your word have I treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, that word for treasured, or your Bible might say hidden, thy word have I hidden in my heart <clears throat> that I might not sin against you. Uh, let me look it up before I say what I think it is. Your word have I stored. Oh, in the um, in the Hebrew, um, it's the word um, sapan, sapan, and it means um, to hoard or to reserve, um, to pre not only to hoard and to but to protect. You not only are you you hiding it, but you're protecting it. You esteem it highly. You're laying up. You're treasuring, you're storing it up like treasure. In the Greek, it's where we get the word thesaurus, a thesaurus. You know, when back in the day when you were in school and you had your dictionary and your thesaurus, um, where, which was a treasury of words, that's what your heart is supposed to be. So that's what happens as we meditate on the word of God. You think about what you have read. You try to understand it. You talk to the Lord about it. You ask him for insight and for revelation, okay? So we, we begin with prayer. We read the Bible. We study the Bible. And then we meditate. We think on it. And listen, that's why I always put notes on my Facebook page. I put the notes there for you to be able to do exactly what, what we're looking at now so that you don't have to take my word for it. You can take the notes and you can examine it for yourself and you can, you to see if what I'm saying is so. You know, well, I didn't agree with her on that. Well, you just check it out for yourself and see whether or not it is so, okay? So, um, um, someone said, we still have your notes for your 90 day reading plan. Oh yeah, back in 2018. Yeah, I usually do it everywhere that I've ever served because it's just a. Um, uh, someone says we need address to send her the new book, The Law of Permission. Oh, okay. All right, I'll give that to you. Me message me and so that I'll remember. Okay. Uh, so um, you meditate on the Bible. Then number five, um, <clears throat> if you're trying to figure out if well, I wonder if if um, the insight that I feel like I'm getting, I wonder if that's right. Well, then read commentaries, read the commentaries of others, but but look to that only after you have um, you and the Holy Spirit have sat down with the Word and you've tried to understand it for yourself. Then read the commentaries to see if you're on the right track. If your view differs from theirs then you want to adhere to the view that is proven by scripture. So if what you thought was right doesn't line up with theirs, you compare both of them to the word of God. Whichever one lines up with the word is the one that is accurate. So we can't be arrogant when it comes to this thing. We're looking for revelation and for truth, okay? So when it comes to um uh study aids commentaries um this is a good uh resource 
you know, if you, if you're a bibliophile like me and you like having this stuff, this is called the Cultural Backgrounds Study Bible, bringing life to the ancient world of scripture. And so this thing is loaded with notes, is loaded with commentary that helps you to understand the cultural historical context of a particular passage of scripture so that you understand what it means in that cultural context so that you then know how to apply it to your life right now, okay? You cannot take something in scripture and give it your own interpretation without having understood what it actually means or meant to the people who originally wrote it. Like um, we can take, um, let's take, um, like let's take the word apostle. I did a whole, um, oh, I'm not gonna find the notes fast enough, but I um, did this Bible study with um, Rick Renner. Rick Renner did a Bible study on the ministry gift of apostle because you have so many people today that will take that title and refer to themselves as an apostle. Well, what was an apostle in the historical context in which the word was first used? That's what you initially want to look at. I can't find the notes fine enough, fast enough. But you want to take, just to take that for instance, you want to take that word apostle and you you do the historical study, what was an apostle? It was a military term back in Jesus' day. The people of his historical cultural context, when he referred to his disciples as apostles, would have understood explicitly what he meant by that because they knew the historical usage of that word, military term. These were generals. These were people who went into territory to conquer and overthrow and establish the culture and the kingdom principles and precepts of the sending king, okay? Um, uh, so I don't, I don't want to do a whole teaching on the apostolic, but but that's what it meant. And, and, and um, so when he, re when Jesus referred to his, his 12 as apostles, he was letting them know that he was sending them on a supernatural military spiritual warfare campaign to overthrow thrones of the enemy and establish the, the culture and the kingdom of heaven in regions and in the hearts of people, okay? And so apostles went in and they built and they established and they planted. And so there are all these things that go with that, you know? So if, if a person appropriates the title apostle, but they have not gone into uncharted territory and, and built and planted and established the kingdom of God and raised up leaders and that type of thing, then they, they are, they are uh, appropriating the wrong term. They're not using it based on the, the way it was used historically. We could very quickly, um, when you talk about commentaries and why it's necessary, um, think about the word church. The word church actually is not in scripture. It's a more it's a later translation of the concept of the ecclesia or a synagogue, a synagogue or an ecclesia, ecclesia, um, which is the legislative assembly. That word later evolved into what we now call church, but the word in scripture that is translated now using the word church was very intentional as uh, we were going through history. You had the Lords and back in the King James day changed the assembly the, um, to the word church because in that historical context, the Kirke or Kirke or church um, was that which was owned by the Lords, the Lords, the, 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 the um, aristocracy, 
They owned all the property and the buildings. So they took the assembly out of homes and the places where the, the, the church gathered for years and they moved it into these buildings and these properties that was owned by the lords and the aristocracy and they called it the church and it did away. So then you took like a particular person high and exalted and put them in the pulpit up here and you put the laity which means unlearned ignorant people in the pews and they can they they completely changed what the scripture means when you see what is translated as the word church but it is the word ecclesia the ecclesia is the legislative assembly of the kingdom of God, the Congress of heaven on earth. We are here to legislate God's laws, to, to bring them into operation in the earth realm. It, it's, it's, the church was meant to be, um, here's the best way I've heard it de, um, described, that um, the church was meant to be a revolutionary movement conspicuous as a vehicle of change. Everywhere that the church is, we, there should be something happening in the lives of people. But we've lost that because we have lost the meaning. Okay, people, praise God. I won't even charge you for that. That was free. All right, so we begin with prayer. We read the Bible. We study the Bible. We meditate on the Bible. We look at commentaries. Speaking of which, another good resource to have, just to have in your library, is Dakes. Dakes Annotated Reference Bible. This is um a this this Bible has got more study notes than you ever thought you wanted. You ever thought you wanted. This Bible has a cyclopedic index in the back. That means that every single word in scripture, if it is used at least one time, you can find it in the index, which will then tell you where you can find that word in scripture. Um, also, it has tons and tons and tons of historical notes and commentary on the text, okay? And um, it just, this, every Bible teacher or real student of the Bible, you should have one of these in your library. There's just tons of, of notes and resources in there. I don't know what else to tell you. It's a, it's an excellent, it's an excellent um, a tool that you can have it as you try to understand the word of God. And you can even get Dakes. I have Dakes on like a, a, a flash drive or something that you can load into your computer so you don't have to carry that big heavy Bible around in this high tech um, culture that we live in. So then you wanna, you wanna obey what you're reading and studying and meditating on. What good is it if you, if you read it, you study it, you get it all. Oh, I see, and then you don't do it. You, you don't do it. We just look again at um, Psalm, uh, Psalms verse one, chapter one, I'm sorry. Psalms number one, that is that opens the whole book. It kind of lays the foundation. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law, he meditates day and night. The person who does that is what? Like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and its leaf doesn't wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. Why? Because he is living in obedience to what he has read. See, you know, what we want is we want the prosperity and the fruit without the abiding in the word and ab and he is the word. In the beginning was the word, the John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So he is the logos. So if we abide in the word, we're abiding in him and we obey the word. 
the Almighty will not continue to reveal truth to you, giving you revelation, bringing a rhema from the Logos, the Logos, the written word of God. Um, he will not bring rhema, which is the present speaking whispers of God, how the word speaks to your heart. He won't keep doing that if you don't begin to obey the truth that you already know. He's not going to give you more. That's really a principle. When it, Even when it comes to prophetic ministry, one of the things that I have found is that you can give somebody a word like, and, and then they come back a few months later, they want another word. And, and without knowing them or remembering the word that you initially gave them, a lot of times they will get the same word repeated. Why? Because they haven't begun to walk out the initial word that they got. They're not doing anything with what God already said to them. So he's just going to repeat what he already said to them so that, and, and keep repeating it until they get it. Okay. So we want to obey, obey what is written if we are to profit by what we read. Okay, what do you think about the, I don't know what the ISR, you gonna have to break that down. What does ISR stand for? I don't know what the ISR Bible is. Um, tell me what that is and then I, I'll respond to that. So obey the Bible. Then number seven, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. You share what you have learned with others so that they may benefit and be edified. I have a couple of friends that I always call when the Lord gives me fresh revelation. I call them first and I usually share. I'll say, listen, I got to tell you this. This is hot off the griddle. So by the time you guys hear it, they have already heard it because I call them and I run, man, I was reading in scripture and this is what I saw and this is what I prayed today, you know? And so I'm letting the light that God has shown on his word, what he has illuminated in my heart. I, I share that with others. For instance, I was reading something on Facebook something somebody had posted um, where they had um, been reading in Genesis and it came to the passage about the flood and um, um, and they got to verse 16, Genesis chapter seven and verse 16. And they were talking about how they, in reading the Genesis narrative, they had been of the impression that the animals came and went into the ark and Noah and his family went in and, and Noah closed the ark. They closed the, Noah and his family, they closed the ark. And they said that it jumped out at them that verse 16 actually says, and the Lord closed it behind him. So the Lord closed the doors of the ark. And they were talking about how um, another translation said, and the Lord sealed Noah and the animals and his family inside. The, he sealed them into the ark. And so this person then began to say oh, the revelation that they got from that. And they were sharing it, that they prayed, Lord God, seal me in the ark of your protection during this pandemic. I wrote it in my journal. I wrote down the passage and I was like, Lord God, yes, seal me and my family in the ark of your protection during this pandemic. So, you know, sharing that revelation with others, you know, that's a part of how we grow in our faith. All right. So let's look at some rules for interpretation as you begin to get into the text. Um, in addition to those seven basic guidelines, here are nine basic rules of interpretation that need to be followed in order to avoid confusion and false doctrine. Somebody say amen. You want to avoid confusion and false doctrine. So here is um, the first uh, rule of interpretation. In other words, when I open the Bible, how do I begin to really interpret 
what I'm reading. Well, rule number one is called the rule of definition. Any study of scripture has to begin with a study of words and their meanings. And if you've been in my Bible study, you know I do that. I, I love doing that. I love looking in, at the languages. That's why I, I recommended this the app, this app, um, the Bible study app, that green one. And uh, uh, let me see if I can close it and then get it to get it to open so you can see it's the olive tree app. So the, there's the green. I click on it. Uh, uh, it did it so fast. It's the olive tree. You have to take my word for it. And they will give you all. It's a it's a wonderful aid, and it's right at your fingertips. So you you any study of scripture must begin with a study of the words. Um, definitions of words are based on their usage in scripture, how the word is used in scripture, um, not on their uses in modern times. Although it is good to understand, like for instance, the word apostle. The word apostle was a historical word that was used definitely in the Roman Empire. And Jesus appropriated that word. And now it is in scripture as a, to um, define those 12 and then those subsequent, subsequently that came after the 12 that still minister in the, in, the, in the gift of an apostle. What is it? What does it mean? Well, you have to know the definition. So... For instance, the word name, we take the word name. Um, the word name in modern times is a label that we use to identify somebody. Well, my name is Bernadine. You know, well, my brother's name is Michael. My sister's name is Barbara. Okay. Well, name in Bible days was far deeper than that. <clears throat> a person's name um, was usually connected to their character and attributes. So when God changed Abram's name to Abraham or Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, when he changed their name, changed the meaning, giving them a new identity. So the names of, that's why it, 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 you have to be careful what you name your children. You can't just stick any old name on your kids because names carry meaning, okay? And um, so when you're looking at something in the word, pay attention to that when a story, for instance, I did a whole message. You guys will remember I did a sermon on Jesus um, uh, on his way um, I think he is actually leaving the area of Jericho. And on that road, there is the um, Bar Timaeus, the son of Timaeus. Okay. And so I've read that story countless times, but for some reason I was drawn to the name Bar Timaeus, son of Timaeus. And so when I did the exegesis, I found out that it's, it's a repeat. Bar Timaeus is actually means son of Timaeus. So it's Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus, like saying it twice. Why? Why? So when I did the exegesis, I found that the, um, the name Timaeus kind of had a double meaning. And so when you, when you begin to read the narrative, you could see that Bartimaeus had become Bartimaeus, that what the word originally meant now he was living the flip side of it. And in him crying out to Jesus, he was restored as the Lord broke the blindness off of him. He was restored to the uh, original honor and identity that was inherent within his name. And those are the kind of things that you'll miss if you don't follow the rule of definition. You look up, look up the key words. What do they mean? What, what do they mean? Because, you know, I've heard people, you, you hear preachers say some of the craziest stuff and you know they haven't studied, they haven't done the exegesis. They're just spitting in the wind, saying all kind of crazy stuff that doesn't make any sense because they have not followed the rule of definition. I'm just trying to help you. Particularly today, 
you 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 have to be able to what we see happening in the world you got to be able to go to the word and find the truth and when you find something in scripture what does it mean okay so you have the rule of definition and then number 2 you have the rule of usage the interpretation of words and phrases has to be understood according to the custom and the dialect of um of a nation okay for instance um the phrase three days and three nights when you find like in reference to the the crucifixion and and um of jesus christ and his time in the grave you'll see the the, the bible um, prophetically referring to three days and three nights um well from a hebraic perspective in terms of usage historically Three days and three nights does not necessarily mean 72 full hours like it would in modern English. From a, it, as a Hebraic idiom, three days and three nights means any part of any one of those days is considered the day. It is what's called inclusive reckoning, okay? So if you don't know that and you're trying to find three full days of Jesus being in the, the grave, then you'll get thrown thrown off. You have to look at the text from a, from a Hebraic perspective and know the rule of usage. And some of you may think, well, how am I supposed to do that all by myself? That's why I'm saying you can get a hold to some good study resources and or you just need to get in a good Bible study like you're doing right now, okay? All right, so you have the rule of definition and the rule of usage. And then you have the rule of context. Every word you read <coughs> must be read in light or, or understood in light of the words that come before it and that come after it, okay? Um, you have to gather the meaning from the context. For instance, if you're in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let me just turn there, <clears throat> and verse 51, and you pull verse 51 out of the context, and you say, well, the Bible says, I'm going to I'm gonna show you something. Let me show. I'm going to tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. And you stop right there. And and you so you're telling some, some we're not all going to sleep. That's why you can't sleep at night. The Bible says we're not all going to sleep. Now, that's just foolish. The Bible says that God gives rest to his people, okay? If you're not getting any sleep, you're going to be sick pretty soon, okay? God designed your, your body to need the cycles of rest and activity, rest and activity. So you cannot pull, we will not all sleep out of context, which is what a lot of people do. Um, that does not mean fall asleep at bedtime. That context is talking about death and life and the grave and being caught up into the presence of the Lord is talking about the mystery of the resurrection. So you have to put it all in context or you will just be somewhere real crazy. I've told you guys before, when I was a young seminary student, let me see if I can find it. Let me see if I can find it fast enough. Um, Oh, it's in uh, Ecclesiastes. I was young, you know, we were, I was in my 20s and we were studying Greek. And, oh, I'm gonna have to Google it so I can find it. Um, a young seminary student, I'm studying Greek. Um, Okay, here it is. Uh, I know it's in Ecclesiastes. This reference is in. Is it conjunct? Come on, 
Isaiah 22, no, there's a reference in Ecclesiastes. Let me look, Isaiah 22 and verse 13. I don't think it was Isaiah, but Isaiah will do. Isaiah 22 and verse 13 says, um, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we may die. Um, when I was a young seminary student and we were studying Greek and you're trying to learn the alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, you know, yoda, lap, kappa, lambda, mu, nu, umricon, p, you know, all of that. We would take a match, strike a match, and the match is burning and you'd have to get the entire Greek alphabet out before the match burned down to your fingertips. And if you couldn't get alpha, beta, gamma, delta, if you couldn't get the whole alphabet out before the match burned down, and you had to drop it. Then you had to drink a shot of sake. <laughs> sake is Japanese rice wine. It is not very tasty. Okay. Well, after you have had about three or four shots or more of sake, you ain't gonna get the alphabet out anyway because now you're starting to slur. And so one of my colleagues, Rockin' Reverend Richie Ryan, I think we used to call him Rockin' Reverend Richie Ryan, uh, Richie was, would quote this passage of scripture, come on, come on guys, the Bible says right here in Isaiah 22 and verse 13, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we may die. <laughs> so come on, that's proof texting. You, you, you can't do that, okay? Um, you will not get the correct meaning of the text. You cannot sit around and get drunk with your friends and use the Bible to justify your drunkenness because you said, well, the words say, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we may die. No, you have to put that back into the context in which Isaiah was prophesying it in order to understand what he meant by that reference. So when we are trying to understand the word, um, you want to look up words. What do they mean? Then you want you want to examine their usage in the cultural context. So two and three really can go together, the rule of usage and the rule of context. And then you have the rule of historical background, a knowledge of the life um, and society of the subject at the time in history is required for a correct understanding, okay? Um, for instance, the story of Jesus telling the disciples, you know, when he's there, they, he wants to prepare for the, the Last Supper. Um, he's, he, he knows he's going to the cross. And so it's Passover season. And so he um, tells his disciples, remember in Luke chapter 22, he says, go and you'll see a man bearing a pitcher of water who will meet the disciples. And he said that this will be um, a sign, follow him. He'll show you where to prepare, you know, for the meal. Well, you know, that doesn't mean anything to us. But if you know the, the rule of historical background, then the, then the story takes on a whole nother meaning because you know that, that that sign would have been so obvious because women carried the water in Israel. Women carried the water um, jars, jugs. They went to the well to get the water. If you see a man carrying a pitcher of water, that would have been very unusual. He would have stood out and he that would have been an easily identifiable sign. This is the one that Jesus wants us to follow. We follow him and we're going to find where we're supposed to prepare for the meal. But if you don't know that it, within the historical context, then you lose the meaning of the text. Um, another thing too, this is why this is so important in Bible study. Like for instance, you know, we got, a, you know, people beginning to reconsider, you know, in times right now. And if you go into um, Paul's letters to um, the, church, the Thessalonians and you get those passages about, um, 
the coming of the Lord. Let me see. Um, in okay, First Thessalonians chapter four. Okay, just real quick, let's look at that. And we're talking about it in the rule of context and then the rule of historical background, all of those things coming together so that you 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 can get an interpretation when you are studying scripture. Okay. Um, look at this in verse 16 in 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. A lot of people re uh, refer to this as the rapture, but they don't look at the rule of historical background. And they don't realize that in this particular cultural historical context where you're in a a world dominated by the Roman Empire, whenever a, an emperor was coming into a region, he went into um, a particular area, there was always a group of people who went out to meet him, okay? Um, the, the important people first. In, in, in Christ, these would be those who have died already, you know, whose, whose, whose bodies are in the, in the grave, but their spirits are, are actually with him. But their body, when you talk about being reconciled to your body um, um, and the, then you have an entourage that goes out to meet the emperor. They go up and they're, they're, they go out or the expression was they go up to meet him. And they are caught up in his entourage or the train of the emperor coming in. So if you don't understand the rule of context and if you don't understand the rule of historical background, then you think you go out to meet him and then he's going to take you back to heaven. But that's not historical that's not historically accurate. The emperor coming in, the people went up to meet him so that they could be in the company that escorted him in for the establishing of his kingdom in, or for him to, to see how his kingdom has been established in a region, okay? And so when people don't understand that, they think they're gonna be raptured and taken out of the earth as opposed to us joining the company of the Lord as his people, as his bride, and coming with him as he comes in to establish his, his throne. That's a completely different thing, okay? And I don't have time to break that down further, but those are just examples. Um, you have to understand the life and the culture you know, of um, the, the, the time. And then there's the rule of logic. The Bible appeals to our reason. It, it invites investigation and it is to be interpreted by a rigid application of the laws and of, of language and grammar, okay? <clears throat> there's, there are certain things that just make sense logically. The rule of logic when you are studying scripture. For instance, when you get into the book of Revelation and you have um, the seals and the trumpets and the plagues, and they are numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Logic tells us that they are numbered to show the order in which they occur in time. So if you take the fifth trumpet and put it before the second trumpet, you violate the rule of logic. And you cannot do that just so that it fits your backwards exegesis. Okay, I'm just saying. I'm just trying to help you. <clears throat> you have the rule of precedent. We cannot violate the known usage of a word and invent another for which there is no precedent, okay? If the scripture gives a particular usage or meaning of a word, then there is a precedent and the usage may be acceptable, okay? And so in other words, all of this is to say, you cannot make up what you want the Bible to say. You know, you can't make up what the Bible means by grace or forgiveness or repentance. You can't make up, well, God loves me. I know because God loves me, 
I know I'm going to heaven. And you ha- you're not doing no. Well, God's love is unconditional. God loves me. And you just throw everything else out. You 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 forget where the Lord says, you know, that um uh if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So if you're not keeping my commandments, then you don't love me. I don't know you. Depart from me. So you you can't just throw stuff out and keep the parts that you like, see, okay? And so then there's the rule of unity. The parts of the Bible are to be interpreted with reference to the whole. In other words, you scripture is very good at interpreting scripture, see? And so you cannot say, well, I'm a New Testament um, believer that we, we don't believe in the Old Testament. What you are doing, you can't do that. You, you can't throw away the Old Testament. That would violate the rule of unity because the Lord did not come to do away with the law. He come that that expression, I came to fulfill it, is a is a Hebraism. That doesn't mean that it's no longer applicable. That means that he came to bring to life the essence of what the Old Testament scriptures were trying to tell you. I came to fulfill. I am the fulfillment of it. So he's not doing away with himself, you know. So you can't toss the Old Testament and say that it's no longer applicable today because you want to live by this cheap grace that says everybody is good and everybody is loved and everybody is getting into heaven. That's just not what the Bible says. If that were the case, we wouldn't need a Bible. We we wouldn't need self. We could all just live how we want to live and do what we want to do. So you have these, these rules when it comes to interpreting the text. There's the rule of inference and inference is a fact reasonably implied from another fact, okay? Um, The Lord proved the resurrection of the dead to the Sadducees by this rule. If you look at uh, Matthew uh, 22, you'll see an example of the rule of inference. Uh, Matthew 22, uh, verses 31 and 32. Um, Oh, this is where the the Sadducees, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection from from the dead. And so uh, um, Jesus is telling them they're mistaken and that they have not understood the scriptures, nor have they understood the power of God. He says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. But here we go, verse 31. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, Have you not read what was spoken to you by God? And so this is the law of inference, okay? Where it says, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So the fact that the Lord identifies himself as I am the God, not I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they did now. No, but the fact that he says, I am the God, it infers that he is um, the God of the living and not the dead. So death from a Hebraic perspective is not a cessation of existence. If people have been telling you that when you die, you're going to be dead and sleep in the grave and you ain't going to know where you are, that is not biblically accurate. You will know where you are. You will be very conscious, very much alive somewhere. You only have two options. You are either with God through Christ or you are in hell. Those are your only two options. And so the law of inference here in this particular passage shows you that he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So anybody that you know that has passed on is very, 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 very much alive somewhere. They are in another realm of existence, the spirit realm, where maybe you're not going to them just yet, 
And hopefully they went to be with the Lord in heaven. If they have confessed Jesus as Lord and lived according to his word, then they went to be with him. If not, then they went to that other place where people go who reject the salvation that God has, has given um, for us, okay? And so then you have the rule of consistency, which an interpretation must be consistent with all other texts. OK, to say the law of God has been done away with is inconsistent with many scriptures. Um, that is an, an example. Um, we, we don't make void the law through faith. OK, God's word is his word. So these are these are some standards. And so I, I, I said all of that. We're out, we're out of time today. I said all of that to say this when it comes to life and uh, and. Um, uh, what we see happening in the world, you you can't make the Bible say what you want it to say so that you can live how you want to live or um, vote how you want to vote. I put it like that. You, as a believer, <clears throat> we are to approach the word using these tools that I just shared with you. If you want to get revelation, I'll, I'll tell you this real quick and maybe we'll pick it up next time. This is a copy of a Bible that you don't want to get. Okay, see this Bible right here? Wait. See, it's called the Queen James Bible. This is a copy of the, a, the, a group um, who, I'll tell you, man, I got like three minutes to, to tell you this. This is a group of people, a... Um, I'm trying to find the name of the organization that did the, the notes. They have extensive notes in here. Um, and what they did is they took the narrative of the King James Version and they put out this commemorative Queen James Version because King James was a notorious bisexual. He was, even though he was married. He is buried between... His, his, his casket is actually between the caskets of his two male lovers. This is a historical fact. Um, he didn't interpret the, the, the text. He hired a team of scholars to work on the King James translation, which is a very beautiful translation. He simply funded it and you know put all these rules regarding translation. But King James himself was a notorious bisexual, okay? Had male lovers, there were people he was referred to reportedly historically as Queen James. They used to tease him and call him Queen James. So these people put out, they took the King James narrative and they broke all these laws that I just told you about. And they reinterpreted all the passages of scripture that make any reference to homosexuality. Okay because they don't want the reader to know what the Bible actually says regarding those issues. And so they call it a fabulous Bible. Come on, guys. Some stuff, if you don't know how to do, and I, and I have a copy of this because when I'm teaching on how to read and study the Bible, I like to show people this is not what you buy and read for the rep for the purpose of study. This is what you have if you're a teacher and you wanna show people what not to buy. And if you wanna show people how the word can be distorted, I could go to some of the passages of scripture to show you how they have violated the rule of consistency and inference and unity and precedent and logic and historical background and context and usage and definition. They have violated, you know, the the reading and studying and praying, all of those things that we want to do in this day and time. It is critical that we learn how to do these things so that, thank you, Holy Spirit, so that we know how to rightly divide the word of truth and live as people who are named by the name of the Lord. Amen. I just wanted to give you that. We'll pick it up next week. This is Pastor Bernadine Wormley Daniel, Soterios Ministries Incorporated. Um, just wanting to exhort you as we um, finish out this year, 
make plans now. Get yourself a journal, get yourself a Bible reading plan, um, and plan to really spend some focused, intentional time in the Word, with the Word, as we go into 2021. Come on, guys, let's not be a part of the statistic that we I shared with you earlier of people who never break open the Word of God. We want to be people of the book, people who know the Lord by the Word and by His Spirit. So, Amen. We um, thank you. I thank you for your time. <clears throat> so Terry's Ministries, if you'd like to sow into what we're doing, it helps to get all of these study resources that I use to help you. Um, you're giving us, we use it for, we have benevolence things that we do as well. All types of things like that. Um, uh, um, so your gifts um, go to um, a good cause. And we are a 501c3 you will get a tech tax deductible receipt um, for the tax season coming up in January. If you have given an offering, we'll be sure to send you a tax receipt that you can use to get your tax credit, okay? All right, guys, the information is in the stream, paypal.me forward slash Soterios Ministries. Make sure you see my picture because there's another Soterios out there. And also um, Cash App, I think is dollar sign, Dr. Bernie, S-M-I. Um, and that also goes to um, Soterios Ministries. God bless you. Love you. Get in the word. Get in the word. Sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his voice and to his spirit. God bless you. Happy birthday, Aunt Mary. I pray the Lord bless you with many more. God bless you. Take care.